Welcome to Real Estate Pro Tips and Strategies. The theme is how to buy a home or sell a home in a changing real estate market. Hi, my name is Pete Sabine and I'm here with my team partner, Leslie Whitney. We are real estate professionals with Compass and the Five Star Real Estate Team here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We want to share with you our real estate expertise to give you a competitive edge and provide insight with useful information so you can make an informed decision for your next home purchase. Leslie and I break down the most important aspects of real estate. Future podcasts will reveal how to navigate as a home buyer or seller. Before we start our podcast, if you're looking at scaling a real estate buy and hold portfolio or simply looking for tips and techniques when it comes to property management or self-management, check out the Landlording for Life podcast with Sean Morrissey and subscribe to get an episode every Monday morning. Visit landlordingforlife.com for all episodes. Hello and welcome to this episode of Real Estate Pro Tips and Strategies. This is Leslie Whitney and I'm with Pete Sabine. The topic today is what to know about home inspections. Buying a home or property is probably the biggest purchase you will ever make, so it's important to make sure your inspection is done by a highly qualified and educated professional. It's vitally important to understand the condition of the property before completing your purchase transaction. Home inspections give you the opportunity to have the home thoroughly examined by a professional trained to find significant defects and safety hazards. Investing in the cost of a home inspection can be well worth it, both for peace of mind and the potential cost of trouble avoided. Your real estate agent should be able to recommend several well-qualified home inspectors if you need assistance, or you can choose your own inspector. Yeah, and so today our guest is Sean Lenhart, and Sean serves as the operations manager for Lenhart Home Services. Do I have that right? You're you're absolutely right. All right, great. And uh, he's a co-owner, and he's also a property inspector for LHS, and we use LHS almost exclusively for all of our property home inspections. Um, And it's a father and son business located here in Northern California. Uh, Prior to the start of LHS, Sean was the project manager for commercial and residential construction. Uh, Sean worked as an apprentice under the supervision of his dad, Kurt Lenhart, for four years before he became a full-fledged inspector. Uh, Sean has over 18 years' experience in construction project management and uh, over five years of home inspection experience. Uh, Kurt Lenhart is the co-owner and master inspector at LHS, and he has over 13,000 inspections completed. Uh, Kurt has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to construction and inspecting, uh, over 20 years in the electrical, plumbing, and HVAC uh, heating and air conditioning field as a contractor, and he has over 25 years of experience as a professional home inspector. So, Sean, tell our listeners about the scope of a typical home inspection. What is included and and what will you do? Well, a home inspection includes exactly what you said. It's going to be the roof, the plumbing, HVAC, electrical, anything going on in the home, the main components we're going to look at. We're going to take apart your your main electrical panel, your sub panels. We'll be looking at the foundation, pretty much anything built in the home we're going to look at. Okay, so then what items are not included in a home inspection? Um, Let's say something like solar. Solar we can't really test, um, a water softener, things that aren't built into the house like refrigerators, things like that, that clients can take with them, washers, dryers, that sort of thing. Irrigation systems. Irrigation systems, yeah, something you can't really physically test or kind of look at when you're there. Not every day things are raining, you know, but let's say I see some stains around the window sills. That's definitely something I'll know, but if it's not raining that day, it's kind of hard to test an irrigation system. Right. Okay. Uh, do you recommend that the buyer or seller attend the home inspection? Yes, if any way possible, yes. But if you can't for whatever reason, because I know people work and whatnot, uh, second best thing you can do is just have your agent present because they're going to be there when I'm there giving specific instructions, things going on in the building, so they kind of have an idea of where things are well, right. defect-wise in the building. Well, I can't stress enough how important it is for the buyer or the seller, depending on who's having the inspection done, to be present for the inspection. And the reason I feel strongly about that is that um, 
when you read a report, it's quite a different experience than actually being present while the inspection is happening. And, and things can kind of get lost and out of context, even in the most well-crafted reports. And a lot of times in these home inspection reports, they, they tend to have a, a template that's used, which is fine. Um, but it, it, in some ways, you can actually read into or out of what's really going on with the property and what, what's being discovered or recommended uh, might seem more um, dramatic than it actually is if you're standing there listening to the inspector and he's pointing out what's going on in, you know, in the real world, so to speak. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the thing. I do houses built from 1898 to 2020. There's always something going on with a building. And even when a builder building's older, let's say like in the eight or, or late 1800s, early 1900s, codes are a lot different today than they were back then. So, right. you know, you could be there and you see a rail isn't 36 inches per se, but back in the day, it was more of the Wild West kind of land and they didn't build them like that. So we're going to go by everything with code today. But again, it peach right. You can kind of, when you're at an inspection, you kind of get a feel and a see for your own house. You know, the house yeah. you're moving into, kind of what's going on, the different corners there are in the in the home if you know if i if, for instance if i put a sloping floor note and you actually walk the house you can kind of tell just from walking it what i'm referring to versus not being there you can take it in different context now when you hear a leak for instance you could think you know for me there's two different things when a leak it can either be a drip or a full-on i have a shower underneath the house right when you're there and you kind of see the pictures when we're going over things and whatnot and i'm kind of there to kind of walk you through the report um it makes life a lot easier for all parties involved. So if there's, like I said in the beginning, if there's any way you could be there, try to try your best to make it out. So yeah, and you take pictures, of course, when you're yes. doing the inspections. But if you're standing there and you're looking at the item, you have a yeah. better sense of the scope and the magnitude and the location. So down the road, when you get the report after you're do done with your inspection, just for the benefit of knowing what's going on, it's much better to have that visual. Yeah, I kind of look at it of an analogy of like when you look at a car on CarMax, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. You can yeah. see the pictures, you kind of look in the interior or whatnot, but it's a whole different world when you're actually kind of sitting in the car and yeah. kind of oh, feeling yeah. it and kind of dialing it. That's yeah. how I kind of feel about a home inspection at the same time. You're there, you're there with me kind of, and I can show you different things about your house, even upgrade, you know, on one of the questions I know you guys are going to get to is maintenance on the house. Well, when you're there, I can actually show you physical things you can do on that house, whether mm -hmm. it be your gutters, the way to do certain things. So, yeah. yeah, I often tell buyers that this is really an opportunity for them to speak to somebody like yourself and sort of get a, it's almost like a homeowner's manual, you know, and, and it's not necessarily just to find faults or defects in the home, but it's really an opportunity to kind of get a good picture of what the home's about and all the ins and outs of it and, and I tips and ideas from you. So absolutely, um, there's a couple of things that you touched on a minute ago when you had the contrast of something built in the late 1800s versus like last week. Yeah, um, so the, obviously the codes vary dramatically. In the old days, some homes are actually built on stone foundations. They just put rocks on the ground yep. and there, that was it. Not too much seismic safety activity going on there compared to modern foundations that use concrete, rebar, steel, yep. hold down brackets, all these modern things to keep the house moving in a shaker here in California. Um, you know, some people believe that if I'm buying a brand new house, why the heck would I need a home inspection? And I'm here to tell you, I've been personally involved with brand new construction where um, it was a, a really good idea to have a second set of eyes on the property. Because even though it's built to modern code and there's a building permit, um, I used to be in construction and I know that on the job site, some things get looked over or missed or uh, whatever. They take the path of least resistance, shall we say. I did a, I did a <laughs> home that was brand new construction. And buyer was going to come in the following week, move into their dream house, real nice house. Well, one thing they forgot to put in was the water heater because it was in the attic. So when oh. we did the walkthrough on the home inspection, we were able to say, hey, water heater hasn't been installed yet. You mean it was and just it, sitting in the attic? It, no, it wasn't even put in. Was, oh, that's, uh, where, it was, I was, that's yeah, where it belonged. But the three people are moving in in a week and there's no oh, water heater installed yet. Right. And so you're talking out. about the walkthrough with the developer that they're buying from to sign off on it, right? No, I, I, we did an inspection on the house. It was brand yeah, new yeah. construction. Yeah, okay. And they, you know, hmm. here's the thing is it's basically being a home inspector is not, is knowing what to look for and the feel of things and whatnot, just my dad is an old contractor from doing HVAC plumbing electrical. I know what to look at. I know what to listen to. 
there's a lot of different things that go into it. And on a job site, especially with newer construction, if you think about it, all their lots and building and development that they have going on at a time, things can just be, you know, kind of fall through the cracks because so much is going on at once and all the different job sites. So again, even getting a home inspection on on a new build, it's good because you got a, a set of eyes that are trained to look at things that you probably aren't trained to look at. Yeah. It's a mass uh, production assembly line, these yes. new home subdivisions. Yes. And uh, and being a former contractor and being on a job site like that, you, you see it. It's not that it was maybe done with intent. It's just of that you're, you're trying to get something done to scale and that, that sometimes things fall through the cracks. Or you had to pull one of your other guys to another building or whatnot. Something yeah. was going on there. Yeah. And then just it was on the plans to get done. And just never got finished. So as a new home buyer, before you close the sale with the new home developer, you have your own property inspection yeah. and you compare notes. And if there's something missing before you close the sale, you have leverage. Once that sale is closed, Sold. your leverage is gone. Yeah. Um, so it's much better to get that done ahead of time. Absolutely. Um, what is the average cost of a home inspection? Normal cost. Well, you guys have used this for a long time, so your pricing is a little different. Normal cost of a home inspection is about four eighty five. Um, mid-sized house, let's say two to three thousand square feet, is um, five ten, and anything above that, if I'm doing, let's say five thousand square feet, is usually about five fifty five. Okay, mm-hmm. and then what about if it's a condominium or a townhouse? Yeah. Condos are a little cheaper; they're about three eighty five, depending on the scope, because condos are different. Sometimes you can have a, let's say it's a condo with no garage, or anything going on, a two one eight hundred square foot, it's three eighty five, but let's say. You want the exterior done and it has a garage and whatnot, it's 430. It's a little bit more, okay. but it's still under the price of a single family home. Somewhere in between. So let's talk about condos for a minute. Sure. Uh, I often see home inspection reports where uh, because it's a condo, they only do the interior. Mm-hmm. And my personal philosophy is that's not enough, regardless of whether or not the homeowner is responsible for exterior maintenance. Um, one benefit of doing the exterior, even though it's under the purview of the homeowners association to, to repair and maintain, if there are any defects involved, um, before you remove your contingency as a buyer, you can go to the seller and say, you know, I want you to give this report to the home, the homeowners association. I want to hear from them. I want to, I want a memo in writing that they're going to take care of this at some point, just to confirm that, you know, we're not making any assumptions here. I've seen that with pest inspection reports yeah. where it can be really gray and ambiguous. You read the covenants and the rules about who pays for what, and they're not always specific to the last nail about what needs to be fixed. Well, usually unless uh, specified not to, we'll tackle the outside. You yeah. know, I'll, I'll poke around and make sure there's no trim or anything going on that. And, right. and you know, it's a little different because normally when you see a home inspection like that, if you see any trim damage or whatnot, you can kind of refer to the pest inspection for estimates or whatnot. But I know HOA, I kind of leave up to you guys. Mm-hmm. But if you want the HOA to tackle it, here it is in the report. Yeah. And what I, I just had that example, what you were talking about the other day in Antioch, where I did the exterior because they asked me to. Okay, no problem. Went out there and she sent the report right away to the HOA. It just helps out. Anything to help in your scenario, buying and selling a house can be stressful. What we try to do as home inspectors is give you a full picture of what's going on with the house. Well, you know, when you get our report, not only are you going to get the defects in the house, but also in in our report, we have what's called styles and materials. What kind of hookups your washer dryer is, Mm -hmm. where your sub panel is located, the amperage of your building, all your descriptions of of what, what the building actually entails. So you have a full kind of, like Leslie said, a whole kind of manual of the house of what you're buying. A home is one of the largest purchases you're ever going to make. And if you can get a whole manual on it, you know, I I look at home inspection reports all the time. Ours is about 50 pages, but you look at it and it kind of tell you the exact, you know, what you're, what you're buying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's really important. So when you inspect a home, sometimes you're there with other inspectors doing different types of inspections. Like most common is a structural pest control inspection, right? Yes. So there's some crossover where you mm-hmm. you and the pest inspector are looking at the same things, but you're looking at it maybe for different reasons in the sense that uh, pest inspectors, um, by their licensing, can actually, they're qualified to bid and repair and give you a quote, whereas a home inspection, you're not getting any cost estimates per se on fixing things. No. Um, So being certified through CREA, we're a neutral third party. We go out to the house and tell you what's going on with the building. 
we don't want to be in a position where we say, hey, you know what? Your furnace isn't running. You give me 3000 bucks by the time we leave, we'll get it up and running. We want to be a neutral third party kind of act is, you know, just want to tell you what's going on for your benefit. And then whoever your agent is has the context, whether it be an HVAC contractor, plumbing contractor, electrical contractor has those contacts to kind of point you in the right direction. Think of us kind of like a general practitioner. When you go see your doctor, we kind of tell you what's going on and send you in the direction of, you know, an ear specialist, eye specialist, that sort of thing. Right. And oftentimes uh, I've used your reports and then you send them, send that report to the specialist, Mm -hmm. whoever that may be. And then they often can kind of give a pretty good estimate on on the cost of the repair. So that's a good time saving tool as well. So you just mentioned something, an organization called CREA. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to point out to our listeners that in the state of California, uh, home inspectors are not required to have a contractor's license. That may not be true in other parts of the country, but that is the way it is here in California. I can't tell you how many buyers and sellers I've met that assumed that the property inspector has a contractor's license. Um, most of them don't. In your case, um, your dad, Kurt, um, has a contractor's license. He was in the contracting industry for many, many years, and he has that actual in the trenches experience of being a contractor. There are a lot of home inspectors out there that have never driven a nail into a piece of wood. They're just trained as inspectors, right? Yeah. So it, it's kind of a different scenario because like we talked about before we went on the podcast, I went to the uh, California Contractors Licensing School to get my certificate in home inspections. Well, it's a little different from being out in the field. My, my dad's an old contractor. I kind of grew up in the field myself doing electrical plumbing and HVAC. There are, it's one thing to learn about something in a book, and it's another thing to get hands-on experience. Like right. I said, in, in my intro, I apprenticed under my dad for four years. I literally went on inspections with him three or four times a day and learned things from him over and over and over, the same kind of way in a contracting field. It's, you know, it, it, as, as you know, Pete, because you worked in, you know, contracting field, it's one thing to read something in a book. It's another thing to actually put your hands on it. Right. It's one thing to inspect something, but it's another thing to fix it. And I've kind of been in both scenarios, you know, from yeah. being able to diagnose a problem and kind of figure out the best way to, you know, run new, replace old knob and tube wiring in a house to actually looking at what I've done in the past. So, yeah, again, with, with just in inspections in general, I would try to find, you know, an inspector that has some kind of contracting background certified through one of the organizations if you can. But I think the most important thing is having some kind of field knowledge or some kind of mm-hmm. contracting background, mm-hmm. because again, it's easy, you know, it's easy to read a book and take a course, but it's another thing to actually have a lot of hands-on knowledge. Well, I was doing three or four inspections a day for four years before I was able to touch any inspection on my own. Right. So that's an apprenticeship program. Yes. So before you're off on your own making all these judgment calls or yes. under the supervision of somebody that's a pro. Yes, he that's was the way it should be. Before he was, you know, before I was apprenticed under him, he was doing it for 21 years. Yeah. So we, we like to say we've seen it all, but on every home, everything is different. So <laughs> it sure is. Um, what, so let's go back to these different organizations. So there's CREA mm-hmm. and then there's ASHI. Those are mm-hmm. both acronyms for two different organizations that you can belong to as an inspection company, right? Yes. Yes. You can pay dues and you go to meetings or whatnot. Uh, like I think we, I talked about before we came on this podcast, my dad was used to be an area manager for a big inspection organization. And what they did in the past is have their members all be CREA and pay dues and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So my dad was part of CREA for a very long time. Right. So, so if you're not, if you don't have a contractor's license and it's not required, if you're going to hire a property inspector, here in California, or even elsewhere, I would look for an inspector that has one or both of those affiliations, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would either, here's the thing, I wouldn't necessarily not qualify someone for it if they were a technician per se in Mm -hmm. in a thing, they worked under somebody doing plumbing, HVAC, you just want to get someone with some field knowledge is the main kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If they, whatever kind of, you know, you just, if you don't, for instance, you don't want to get someone who, let's say, was in, IT for a long time, wanted to try their hand at doing home inspections. And like you said, never drove a nail through anything. You know, you don't want to be in that scenario. You kind of want to, because people, you know, I look at homes all the time and every home is very, 
you know, nothing, yeah. not, not two are alike. So you kind of want to have some hands-on experience to explain to somebody what's going on. And the best inspectors I've met, I've met quite a few good inspectors can kind of lay things down into layman terms. I can sit here yeah. and tell you about knob and tube and go on for hours, but I really on an inspection, I want to be there to explain things that you can understand. Isn't knob and tube a rock band? No, okay, <laughs> oh, Pete, I know you know better than that. You're an old contractor. So. Knob and tube. <laughs> okay, your turn. <laughs> okay, so we talked about um, we talked about whether the the buyers or sellers should attend home inspections. What's what's included in a property inspection report? So how we break down our reports are accent items, consideration items and styles of material. Okay. Action items are bigger things. Plumbing, HVAC, structural, uh, more health and safety kind of items. That I always like to look at action items as something you want to tackle right away. Mm-hmm. Consideration items, smaller things you can do over time, more like maintenance items. Mm-hmm. Caulk around your sink, caulk around your shower, smaller things. Styles and materials are more descriptions of your building. Amperage of your 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 home, where your sub panels look for your laundry equipment, what kind of hookups they have, um, what kind of siding your building is, what what the roofing material is, that sort of things, descriptions of the home. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So basically, it's like prioritizing yep. things that you want to get to right away. Yes. Push off down the road; it doesn't matter. Get to them when you can. Yes. And then just things that are general knowledge yes. about the house, because every home is unique. Even if Absolutely. it's a tracked home, yes. especially over time, as you know. Those tract homes become highly modified, sometimes yes. legally and sometimes illegally. Hi- highly <laughs> modified, we can say. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to drive home on this podcast, too, if, if you're looking to do something, talk to Pete and Leslie about getting a qualified contractor to work on your house as well. Right. Some people watch a couple episodes of HGTV <laughs> and think they know how to yeah. tackle everything. And those are the houses when I have a uncle hank come over and fix a couple of things <laughs> yeah. those are the homes that run into the biggest problem so you uh, got two good real estate professionals here they see our reports all the time and have different contacts always hire a professional to do some work so yeah. the one i like the best is why do i need to spend 12 bucks on a permit you know yeah and so i'll tell you why because when you go to sell it <laughs> yes you got guys like you yeah and people like us they you know, know where's the permit <laughs> and the reason the permits and really important is is that it confirms that the repair or improvement was done to not a maximum standard, a minimum standard, right? Building yes. codes are minimum standards. Yes. Now, just because they didn't, someone didn't get a permit, that doesn't mean it wasn't done correctly or to code. We see that too. Yes. Uh, and codes change all the time, yes. right? Yes. Yearly at least, and sometimes even more than that, I bet. Codes change to protect people from themselves. Yeah. So, you know, right. by the time I'm my dad's age, my dad's 63, rails are going to be over six feet tall. <laughs> someone's going to find a way to fall over a rail. Yeah. It yeah. just is what it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, codes change with the time. Uh, things get more efficient over time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know when a contractor takes a shortcut and when they don't. Yeah. I can look at something. That, uh, you can get some guy who's going to work for half the price and maybe he can fool you. But anyone coming into your house who's a professional in their trade will know better. So mm-hmm. that's why I always recommend to hire a professional. Mm-hmm. And that's a good point. So as a as an example, my mom uh, lives in a manufactured home in Sacramento. She just had a brand new heating and air conditioning system put in. And uh, I stopped by to visit a couple of weeks ago and she brought me out to look at the work. And it didn't look like something was done correctly um, with the return line to the furnace and all that. And they couldn't put the door back on because now it didn't fit in the closet. That's all, that's one thing led to another. <laughs> so me being, you know, my background yeah, yeah. is gone. All right, here's some clues. Uh, did they get a permit? Did you see anybody from the building department come out here and inspect? Because one thing I've learned about contractors, sometimes they'll tell you, and it said right in her invoice, the permit was included. They charged her for it. But here's a telltale sign. If you don't see a city or county building inspector come out to your property, there wasn't a permit. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually apply for the permit to make you think that that is all you need. It's very official looking, the application, but it's not the final approval on the permit card. So that permit card needs to have a signature and a date and it says final right next to it. If they don't hand that to you at the end of the job or it's not affixed to the dwelling when they're done, you need to start asking questions because you didn't get what you paid for. Absolutely. The, the two places where I see the most <laughs> hidden things are the crawl space and the attic. And the right. reason why 
because nobody checks it. That's right. And nobody goes down there to look and no one goes up mm. to look. They just right. kind of assume everything's okay. But I've seen things, for instance, and when you have a plenum, which is your main return for your uh, furnace, all the soil should be dug out from that plenum because it'll rust out over time. People will put in new ducts and say everything's done. No soil con- There's still soil contact with that plenum. Someone says, hey, I got a new furnace. It should be working fine. Well, the plenum's rusted out. No one did anything about it. And yeah. Now we're in an, another scenario. And it can cut the lifespan of your duct work in half, maybe yes. even less than that. Yes, just yeah. and, and just about maintenance questions, what you're, what you're talking about. Since we're talking about HVAC, we'll always give maintenance things. One of the main things you can do to keep your uh, furnace running right is change your filters out quarterly. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many dirty filters I see in houses where if you just change them out quarterly, it's not going to put that much pressure on your system. When, you're, you, when your system has to suck in air in a dirty filter, it takes that much more off your lifespan of mm-hmm. your equipment. It does. It also raises your PG&E bill. Yes. It draws more amperage to run the furnace. Yes. I moved into a house a few years ago, opened up the closet door where the furnace was. I went to change the filter. Yeah. My God, that thing was <laughs> caked. I see it it had like a couple just, of inches just bonded the to the filter. I pulled that thing out and then I looked at the blower motor, the fan. Yeah. It was caked as well. And it That's, was basically toast. Yes. And, and again, you if they just would have changed their filters out right. quarterly, it, you know, I say quarterly. I know nobody's perfect. Okay. And you may just do it three times a year. I would shoot for a quarter, but at least you're going to... You, Shoot for the moon and at least hit the stars, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I have a quick layman's question. So uh, regarding permitting, so I know you need a permit for a water heater, right? Replacement. It, but it, but is, is an inspector going to come out to check the water heater? I didn't think so. No. Um, with So on water heaters, it's a little... I can check a water heater and tell if it's done by a professional in about five minutes. Main thing you want to look for on a water heater is your temperature relief valve, which is your safety for your uh, water heater is ran to the outside. All professionals are going to do that. What all what else they will do is strap a water heater correctly. Most people think they can stri- just put two straps on a water heater and go. That's not the way it works. In California, a water heater has to be seismically restrained, which means it has to go into one of the walls of the building. So if the whole thing, if it were to rock back and forth, the whole thing wouldn't tip over. So those, okay. there's a couple of things I can catch off the top that when Tell, I used to install water heaters. red flags. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Because yeah. most people will... It's water heaters now, from what I get from plumbers, is about 25 to three grand to put in. Wow. You can usually pick up a water heater for seven, eight hundred bucks. So if you look at cost oh. of labor and whatnot, most people yeah. want to try to do oh, it themselves right, to cut. Right. Sure. Yeah. But you just want to make sure you're doing it properly. Because again, I, in the state of California, you need three things to sell your building you need a carbon monoxide in each level of the house. Okay. Right. It needs to be in the hallway. It can't be in any kind of closed door situation. You need smoke detectors on each level and in the bedrooms, and the water heater needs to be strapped correctly. Right. So those so, are minimum state point yes. of sale ordinances that you have to everywhere, anywhere yes. in the state. Yes, but when people yeah. cut corners in the water heater, then I come out yeah. and say it's not strapped correctly. Yeah. And now, it, you know, sometimes they'll have to move pi- pipes, different things and whatnot, yeah. and then it yeah. kind of creates. That's why I always say it may cost you more up front, but if you – if you hire a professional to do stuff around your house, it's going to save you in the long run. Yeah, it's a false economy yes. not to get a permit, period. Yes. If it requires a permit, it's then just... You, yes, yeah. Mo- most modifications in mm-hmm. buildings. Like, So let's say you're going to move your furnace from your garage to your attic, you're going to need a permit. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. How long does it take for you to do a home inspection? Uh, depending on the house. Uh, home inspections are hard because they all vary. Mm-hmm. Let's say you've took perfect care of your house and yeah. it's modeled. Nothing's perfect, that, no matter what. But and usually from an hour and a half to three hours, just okay. depending on what we find. Yeah. yeah and you if, you're, if the house is on a slab floor, there's nothing to look at yes. underneath it. That's going to cut out at least 20 minutes, maybe 30 yes. minutes. Yes. And if I have a lot to look at in the crawl space, if thing, a lot of things are going on, yeah. it takes me that much longer. Yeah. So. Well, let's, before we move on to the next item, let's talk about multi storied dwellings. Um, mm-hmm. Do you folks bring a ladder to your inspections? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I don't Is know. Is that a sign of a good inspector? Yeah, if, you, if your inspector doesn't have a ladder <laughs> in his car or truck. Or right. a flashlight. You, you, yeah, just 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 go. <laughs> just just say, hey, I need to cancel the appointment. <laughs> Call Pete and Leslie and they'll, they know how to reach us yeah. or a trusted inspector. Yeah. Yeah, you need certain tools to do our job and ladder is top of the list with so, flashlight. So the reason I'm bringing this up because this is one of the pet peeves I have about the majority of licensed structural pest control inspectors. 
a lot of them will roll up to the house with nothing more than a step ladder. And they, so they come to a two story house with a step ladder. And what are you getting? You're only get you're paying for a full inspection. You're getting half of an inspection because they're not even going to get up to the second half of the dwelling. Yeah. And yet you just paid full boat for that report. You think you got it all yeah. done, and then these guys follow the home the pest inspector, and they discover all these other things on the second level that wasn't even addressed in your report. So be advised if you have a multi storied house and the inspector rolls up without a ladder, send them home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have ladder, no ladder, no flashlight, no inspection. <laughs> right, right. It's really, yeah, it's like no shoes, no shirt, no service, right? No yeah, flashlight, right. no yeah. ladder, no inspection. Yeah, okay, where are we here? Um, well, did we talk about some red flags to look for? Well, what I, what I generally tell people about home inspectors is that they're designed to spot red flags. They're designed to create awareness around defects, uh, where there might be a repair or safety hazard present. They're, they're, uh, there to recommend to go deeper if it warrants it, right? To get a specialist out. I'll, I'll kind of put it like this. So I walk into a house and people are so freaked out about a crack in their ceiling, right? And it's just a crack in the ceiling. Buildings settle over time. It's going to happen. I much rather see a crack in a ceiling than a bad patch job, right? Yeah. See a bad patch right. job. It just kind of sticks out like, oh, yeah. but so many people see red flags that aren't red flags, right? Yes. Usually in a home inspection, think of a home inspection kind of like a puzzle. It's multiple things that make something wrong, not just one, especially in a foundation, right? But really affects your foundation. When you have a crack, it's over, number one is over a quarter of an inch. Number two, when it's vertical displacement, when one, when one edge is, is kind of going over the other edge, then also when you're getting moisture in there and it's rusting out the rebar. So on a lot of this stuff, it's multiple things. People will, I, I get calls from people sometimes that, you know, just, just people who have got my number from realtors and whatnot, who just feel a little bounce in their floor and are just over the, you know, someone didn't look at this, blah, blah, blah. Can you come out? Sure, I'll come out. And it's nothing. So I always get so many false red flags mm -hmm. comparative to what actually are red flags versus when you yeah. have kind of a crack in your corner, it's kind of starting to tape sheer off right. and then the floors are bouncy and whatnot. Then I kind of go, okay, there, there could be something under here. I need to investigate this corner. Yeah. I always make mental notes when I'm walking around. I'm always not just looking. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm smelling and smelling. You kind of gas leak, anything like that. There's always a couple of things going on in a home inspection that I'm kind of doing. So, right. Yeah. Right. It, you kind of inspect with all of your senses. Yes. Right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Cause yeah. you know, again, doing, doing, I know you've worked in construction too. You smell a gas leak on there. You're, you're turning everything off and getting I'm everyone out of the house. Yes. I'm gas telling leak. you guys, you got to go. We'll call PG and you have I'm calling you from the yeah. highway. Hello. Okay, Pete, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that, so basically you're a house whisperer. Yeah, I try to be as best yeah. as I can. You know what I mean? I try to focus and concentrate. But again, I, there's so many things where people will find false red flags, things right. that I see in all houses that, you know, it's just a normal, there's always going to be wear and tear on a house. There's always cosmetic wear and tear. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? How old the building is. Sometimes a building settles will develop a minor crack, but what looks even worse is when someone doesn't match paint and does a bad patch job, I rather see the crack than, than <laughs> yeah. a bad paint job. And let's talk about the reality of that because yeah. most people usually tune up their homes cosmetically to sell them for top dollar. That's a great thing to do. It makes perfect sense. And in the process of doing that, what are they doing? They're painting, they're patching, yeah. they're filling, they're making the house look great. Um, in California, we typically, you know, we have soil here that's expansive. It moves seasonally. Yeah. Older construction is just known for settling and yep. you can patch a crack and six months later it comes back. Come back. That doesn't mean the house is sliding down the hill or going anywhere. It's just the way it is. Yep. Some buyers that have never owned a home before, they see a crack and they flip out. They, it looks scary to them. They don't understand. So I've had you know? that happen before where there's been cracks in the ceiling. And if some, I always, listen, if you want to do extra inspections on top of me, that's fine. If you want to get a structural guy out, you guys probably know a good structural guy. Right. I have structural contractors that I know. I say, hey, you know, this right. is, my dad's worked with this guy forever, blah, 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 come out. I've had them come out and tell them the same thing I have. Some, yeah. You know, if, you, if you're inclined, you can do any inspections you want. But again, I see in in this business a lot of false red flags where you can waste your money on versus in a home inspection, like I said, it's kind of a puzzle where you kind of look at multiple things that are going on and then you kind of give a full analysis once you have the whole picture. And that's what I'm there to give you the full picture. 
You've yeah. walked it a couple of times. You've seen a couple of things and whatnot. You kind of have some red flags in your mind. I mean, they're there to put you at ease or I could be putting you on another path to look at something different that you haven't seen before. So, yeah. And yeah. so that gets back to, you know, some buyers really, they don't even know the right questions to ask. Some of them have questions, but they're maybe not even the right questions to ask. So having the inspection really helps to put everything in the proper context. They can go down the right path, right? Yes. And then it's, it, so I always like it when the buyer slash seller is there and the agent, because sometimes the agent will kind of verbalize for the seller what they're trying to say or what they, they forgot about that you guys have talked about them in the past about, they had a concern about, and yeah. you guys can kind of say, hey, what about this? And they'll go, oh, yeah, blah, blah, because maybe they didn't get that question answered. Maybe it was something they talk, thought about that I looked at and it was nothing, but still you guys have talked to them, had a conversation with them in the past, and then at least we can put their mind at ease. And so one thing that um, if it's available and if it's possible – when the buyer shows up to an inspection, if they can bring with them a copy of the seller's disclosure forms, the questionnaires that the sellers are required to fill out to sell the house, sometimes there are some things or questions that come from those documents that the buyer wants answered from yeah. somebody that's a trained third-party professional, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of the disclosures, I'd say 75%, it's very open-ended where there's, they add more questions that need to be because they don't know the exact plumbing that was put in. Right. Maybe they're the fifth buyer of the house and don't know different things. But sometimes in disclosure, it can be very helpful. Or, you know, there'll be a nick in a laminate flooring and then it'll throw everyone into ease. And I'll say, you know what, it's just a, it's a little water damage in this spot. You need this and that to, to fix it up. And then it mm -hmm. kind of clears up that question versus it's a foundation issue of the, the nick and we can mm -hmm. fill the floor sloping. Well, if I'm under there and all the pier posts are, are all up, uh, are all parallel to each other and there's no kind of uh there's no dips in those peer posts or anything none of them come off their pad then it kind of puts everybody at ease too mm -hmm. so yeah so then once the inspection is completed then what's the typical turnaround time to get the report in the hands of the buyer or the seller 9 a.m the following business day okay. my dad has always <laughs> preached to me my entire life we have too much work going on today to get to it tomorrow so we have to do it today <laughs> so 9 a.m tomorrow I and like, like yeah. i said if i ever showed up to an inspection without a ladder you'd probably never see me again because my dad would make sure i was doing plumbing underneath the house again so. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah um all right. So what happens next on our side when we get that inspection report? Typically, um, if we're in the middle of a sale transaction and we're representing the buyer, there's a timeline, a deadline in most cases where the buyer has a contingency in their purchase agreement to approve or disapprove of the condition of the property. And so these inspection reports basically serve as a benchmark to confirm the existing condition. And from there, the buyer then has to decide if they're going to move forward with the property and it's as is, or go back to the seller with this information and say, look, we didn't know this existed when we made our offer. And now we see this for what it is. Um, why don't we try to work out something that's agreeable to, you know, up for a repair concession or something like right. that, right? Right. And I think us as realtors, often we get the question, you know, there's a leak in the ceiling. God, what should I do? Should we ask for a concession? What do you think? How's that going to go over? And and what are there? What are our chances of that? And a lot goes into that. As and I think that's sort of part. Of, that's part of our job as realtors to really guide our buyers to understand the risks and rewards for asking for concessions. And that depends on many different things. Um, right. And in our market right now is. As you know, it's very, very hot in most areas. It's a seller's market. We have a lot of offers that have no inspection contingency, but the buyer is still doing inspections mm -hmm. or the seller is doing inspections ahead of putting the house on the market. Um, to, to be able to sell the house in an as-is condition, the best way I know to do that is to have confirmation of what the condition actually is. And you can't get there unless you have inspections. So if the goal of the seller is to sell it as is with no repair concessions or contingencies, then getting the home inspection done ahead of time makes a lot of sense. I, yes. I think one of the most important things I know is talking to Leslie about this before the podcast, but I always get asked that question, why a listing inspection is important. Well, just imagine you're, you're in a hot market like we're in now. And you're, con you're contingent on your dream home. You found your dream home. You want to move in. You want to sell your house. Let's say you don't have inspections done. 
someone hires me, I come out, I'm working, you know, I'm doing the inspection and whatnot. Let's say I find something wrong with the HVAC. Well, HVAC is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, right? So let's say the condenser isn't working. Now you have to wait and hire an HVAC professional come out and the market's busy for anyone working in the field right now. Let's say they're a week, week and a half out. Now it's thrown everyone into kind of a limbo situation. Things are kind of up in the air now versus in the beginning. If the inspections were done up front, here's what's going on. You talk to your realtor about what what you want to fix, what you want to leave alone. You can disclose it. You can move on. But at least the buyers would have had in their hands a copy of the inspection report. And we always offer consultation on any of our reports. I get calls from buyers all the time on inspections reports, what to look at, what not, you know, what, what, what would be my main concerns with the house and whatnot. I'm able to kind of put them at ease or, you know, you want to look at this or that. And when everything's done up front, I can kind of, you know, every, the picture is clear for everybody. Versus trying yeah. to have to hunt around for yeah. another contractor after that we've gone out. So yeah, yeah absolutely. And we, we went over that in a in a previous episode about what what to do to prepare your home for sale, and that's definitely an important part. And like you said, also good inspectors are willing to take calls from whomever yes. who see your report in writing and want to ask you more questions. And I often encourage my buyers to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that gives them a peace of mind. You know, yeah, we'll so. always offer a consultation with our report, mm-hmm. even if it wasn't for that exact buyer. Yeah. Someone wants to give us a call, we'll kind of walk them yeah. through what we found and whatnot. So. so what we're really talking about here in a case of what we call a pre-sale property inspection that's done by the seller is going through a transaction in a proactive mode versus reactive. Reactive would be, hey, it's a hot market. We want to sell it as is. Let them do all that. Let's just put the sign up, see what happens. Well, what might happen is things are discovered that you didn't know about, the buyer didn't know about, and kaboom, that great sale that you had goes bye-bye. Now you're back on the market, which is never a great thing, even in a hot market. Um, But also, it's just a much more intelligent way to navigate through the course of complicated transaction. Once you have that report as a seller, your realtor can get involved and counsel you about, well, yeah, I know we wanted to go as is and all that, but we just found out that there's a a significant safety hazard. And whether you sell the house or not, you probably want to fix that gas leak today. Yeah, You know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sean, for joining us today. It's been very informative. You're Um, very welcome. You can be reached, Sean can be reached at 866-791-2713 or go to lenhartshomeservices.com. That's L-E-N-H-A-R-T, homeservices.com. I'm Leslie Whitney with Pete Sabine, and we are Five Star Real Estate Team. Discover more real estate pro tips. Find our par- podcast at fivestarrealestateteam.podbean.com. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. We hope you enjoy our real estate pro tips and strategies, and we encourage you to share our podcast with anyone who's looking to buy or sell a home. Be sure to like and subscribe if you have not already. And if you are watching on YouTube, feel free to ring the bell next to the subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lubman and Painless Podcast for making this podcast happen. Discover more real estate pro tips Find our podcast at fivestarrealestateteam.podbean.com and check out our new website, r5starteam.com.